Good afternoon. Welcome to our first concert of winter quarter. Uh, we have a few concerts coming up. We have no noon concert next week. So next Thursday, we will see you somewhere else, not here. Um, we'll hope to see you in two weeks. But this Friday, we have a concert that our clarinet teacher is giving, Ann Lavin. It's at 7 p.m. in here. And um, I will be there. I am a clarinetist. You should all play clarinet. You should come. It's going to be great. <laughs> I just taught my class for an hour and a half. I'm a little giddy. Um, uh, next weekend on Friday, we have the Daedalus Quartet here, a uh, string quartet, and they are going to play a piece uh, by me next Friday. But they're also going to play Beethoven Opus 59, number two. It's one of the Razumovsky quartets. Uh, it's a great piece. Many of us, many of the students are studying it in class right now. Um, and that will be a really great performance. If you want to catch a glimpse of Daedalus doing uh, Beethoven quartets, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it on our website. And then next Saturday at 2 o'clock, uh, they will play the graduate student pieces. And that's a free concert at 2 p.m. on um, not this weekend, but the following weekend on Saturday. Um, I'm supposed to remind you to turn off your cell phones or anything that beeps, and I'm supposed to remind you that in the case of an emergency, there are two exits right there that you should take one here. Uh, thank you so much, and enjoy. I didn't say anything about Good. that. Shall I just go?
everybody for coming to this noon concert. As many of you know, I'm not accustomed to standing up on a stage and playing music. I'm more accustomed to standing up and talking about music. Long ago, I made the decision that I'm more of a talker than a player, and that's why I became an ethnomusicologist. Uh, but playing music, of course, is a very important thing to me and should be a very important thing to everybody who's involved with music, which means it's an important thing to everybody. If you don't play an instrument, learn how to play one and take the opportunity to perform with other people. Um, since this is a noon concert and not a noon lecture, though, I will try to keep my comments to a minimum. But I thought it might be useful before going on to point out what a harp looks like, how a harp works, and what it looks like inside. Many of you have probably never been very close to a harp. How many people know much about the harp? There's one person. <laughs> anyway, the, the operative thing about a modern concert pedal harp is that it has a whole bunch of pedals here in the back. And basically, when I want a sharp or a flat, the equivalent of the black keys on the piano, I have to mess around with these pedals, um, which makes life a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, I can't always see what I'm doing down there, so often I make uh, pedal errors, which I then have to figure out how to correct while still remaining graceful and beautiful in my upper body. <laughs> each pedal has three positions, so each string I can play three notes on. For example, this is a C string, and I can play a C flat, a C natural, and a C sharp on that at, the, all, uh, at different times. I obviously can't play them all at the same time. This leads to one really cool <laughs> trick on the harp, which is that you can play the same note on two different strings. So here I have a C sharp and a D flat, and that means I can do a lot of repeated notes uh, without actually having to reactivate the string each time. It sounds like a good thing, but it's not. It really actually makes life a lot more difficult trying to deal with the pedals to do that. But this next transcription of a, um, of a, a Renaissance keyboard piece, or a Baroque keyboard piece, takes great advantage of this repeated note trick in making the piece playable on a pedal harp. So I hope you'll enjoy this next piece uh, as much as I enjoy listening to it. It really is a very a programmatic piece. It depicts a hunt, a king's hunt party, going, coming from the distance, coming into your view with the foxes running and the dogs barking and the horns blaring. And I'm sure I can make all of those annoying noises come out of this heart. Mm. So enjoy. <clears throat>
At the, San, at the not the San Francisco Conservatory, the Paris Conservatory, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, and he was really interested in exploring the kinds of impressionistic techniques that the harp could do. Some of these things include harmonics and glissandi, etc. So you'll hear that he's worked these effects into his um, all of his pieces. He had a special reason to do this as a composer because there was a competition going on in Paris at the time between a different kind of harp that was a fully chromatic harp that had a set of two sets of strings that crossed each other, and so you could play all 12 notes without all of this pedal faulty roll. And this was an instrument that various people promoted and tried to make a popular instrument uh, in France and tried to take over the pedal harp. So Tournier wanted to make sure everyone remembered these beautiful effects that the pedal harp can do and the um, chromatic harp can't do. 
He also tried to get rid of the chromatic harp by marrying the professor of chromatic harp at this, the Paris Conservatory and keeping her at home cooking and stuff like that. So the, currently the pedal harp program continues in Paris. The, uh, the chromatic harp program died out in the 1930s. <laughs>
a composer who lived here on the West Coast for many, many years, and he was fascinated with alternative tunings. And around the 19, late 50s, early 60s, he discovered that harp was a possible outlet for this kind of thing. He had taken to tuning his own piano in all of these crazy tunings, but as anybody who's tried to tune a piano knows, it's a lot of trouble to do that. And it turned out that Lion and Healy, the manufacturer of big pedal harps, had tried to open their market up by making a little harp about this size. This is not a Lion and Healy troubadour harp, but they invented this thing called the troubadour that was a small, inexpensive harp that, Lou found, that Harrison found out he could tune fairly easily with just this handy dandy tuning device. So he spent a lot of time with his ear very, very close to the harp trying to figure out what tunings he liked and how to make them happen. So the first piece we're going to play is in uh, Just Intonation, which is a, a tuning that, that Harrison was crazy about, in which the triads, these chords, are supposed to be very, very pure, not like the ones on the piano that are tempered, where the E is a little bit higher than it should be, and the G is a little bit lower than it should be. I don't know if you can hear the difference here. Slightly, this one is slightly higher than that. And so, uh, if you can actually hear, Luke Harrison claimed that it made a huge difference in the sound of the piece, um, although he did allow people to play it in whatever intonation they liked because he thought it would be better to have the piece played than to have to wait to have a separate harp to play it on each time. But here I'm trying to honor his intention by playing this first piece, a Jala in honor of Leopold Stokowski on a just intoned harp. And for those of you who don't know what a Jala is, it's a Indian form where there's a melody that is interspersed with a drone. Every time the melody has a rest, the drone is supposed to play a note. So hopefully you'll hear that texture in this piece. <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. Harrison. Um, but this is he, using the small troubadour harp, he also uh, had just entered into a new relationship with a man named Bill Kolvik. And so he liked to write music for the two of them to play together. And he excerpted one of the themes from that for this little harp piece. Thank you. 
but not least, a piece Harrison wrote for his friend Beverly Bellows, who was a harpist at San Jose State, where Lou was teaching. And again, I'm going to be joined by the amazing Chris Froh. Big round of applause. Uh -huh. The really beautiful thing about these percussion parts is that they are only loosely coupled with the harp parts. Chris is given about two measures to play, and he's told to play them over and over again until he hears the harp stop. <laughs> <laughs> Which hopefully the harp only does at the end. Are you ready? special effects for the harp so that uh, contemporary composers would be want to compose for it. And he composed a number of etudes that have tried to incorporate most of these effects. And this is the last etude in his book, The Modern Study of the Harp, which is called Chanson d'Alenoui, um, song, song in the Night. And it includes practically every special effect he could pull out the sleeve. <laughs> Thank you. 
What's that? Thank <laughs> you. 